Some things are worth fighting for. Paul knew it, Martin Luther knew it. The gospel is worth fighting for in our day because again, if we change it, we cut ourselves off from the presence of Christ and we obscure God's saving power. There is no other gospel. Welcome to Summit Life today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is J.D. Greer and I'm the pastor of the Summit Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. I wanna thank you for joining us. Um, All right, let me give you a little history lesson as we get started today. Did you know that it has been more than 500 years now since the Protestant Reformation? That's when Martin Luther, if you've heard that name, posted his 95 theses on the door of his Catholic Church and called Christians everywhere to return to, to the true gospel, the biblical gospel, the gospel that saves us by grace through faith alone. It's a gospel very different than religion, a gospel that has life in it. So you may ask, well, why is it that the the words of an old German monk would still be relevant to our lives today? Well, the answer lies in Martin Luther's favorite book of the Bible, the Apostle Paul's most concise and profound explanation of the gospel found anywhere in the Bible, and that is in the book of Galatians. So I want you to turn back to chapter one or turn your Bible on and find um, Galatians one as we continue our message that we began last week. I call this teaching Freedom in the In-Between. You ready? All right, let's jump into God's word together right now. Everybody has rules. The problem, the problem was that with the rules that I grew up with and many of the churches that I was a part of is that they were the center of Christianity for us. They were the thing that we most focused on. If we did them, God would accept us and we would be spiritual. So see, I usually left these religious gatherings thinking about what I needed to do to make myself more acceptable to God rather than trusting in what God had done for me and promised to do in me as the source of my spiritual life. Other churches emphasize learning correct doctrine. And y'all, I love doctrine. But these churches measure how close you are to God by how much theology you know. Education does not equal transformation. And transformation does not come from a mind stuffed full of knowledge. It comes from simple childlike faith in the gospel. There are other churches that focus on practical tips for living. You listen to the sermons and they're all about how to do this or how to become that and how to accomplish this. And that's good. Yo, I love relevance, I love practicality, it's kind of in my nature, but the problem in these churches is that you leave thinking of a how-to list of what you are supposed to do, rather than looking to what God has done for you as the secret to the power to change in the Christian life. The power in Christianity is not found in a helpful to-do list from Uncle JD, the power in Christianity is found in faith in what Christ has done. Some churches are gonna put all their emphasis on some dimension of social justice. Real Christians care for the poor. Real Christians are into racial reconciliation or whatever. And y'all, that's great. Those are all an essential part of being a disciple. But the power in Christianity comes not from a new social agenda. The power in Christianity comes from simple faith in what God has done. Do not mix up ever the implications of the gospel with the gospel itself. The gospel itself is not about what you are to do in any sphere. The gospel is not about what you are to do, it's about what Jesus has done. And when you put faith in what Jesus has done, into you is released all the power to do. Jesus' last words on the cross were not, I got it started, now you go finish it up. His last words on the cross were, it is finished. And when you believe that, it credits you with righteousness of Jesus Christ to your account and it infuses Jesus' resurrection power into you. That is it, nothing more. Which leads me to number two. Paul says, after you reject it, I want you to fight for the true gospel. I want you to fight for the true gospel. Paul has used the strongest language imaginable here. He has said that preachers and teachers, or even angels who distort this gospel should be cursed. Now, most people don't like any kind of fighting or controversy in the church. And honestly, I agree. I don't like strife. But Paul says some things are worth fighting for. Some things are matters of life and death. If you pervert the gospel, he says, you're gonna do two things. You notice this, verse six, he says, you're gonna turn away from him who called you by the grace of Christ. In other words, you're gonna desert Jesus. 
And the last person that you want to walk out of his presence is Jesus. This is not a matter of, of this range of what we can believe and let's just all get along. This has to do with whether or not we are connected to Jesus' saving power. Secondly, he says you condemn people by pointing them to another gospel that's actually not another gospel at all. There is no other gospel. You're giving people who are dying of thirst, you're giving them a cup of hydrochloric acid. And it might look like water, but it's not water. It's not going to bring life. It's going to bring death. And Paul says those two things, the presence of Jesus in your life and the way of salvation, those are things worth striving for, even if it means you have to sometimes offend people and even if it means you have to create division and enemies, which brings us back to the Reformation. What was so important? that Martin Luther was willing to split the church over it. Martin Luther was a German university student who was studying law at the urging of his parents who were paying for his education. His family was not super religious. They were just normal religious like most Germans at the time. He was a a good practicing Catholic. One day, Martin Luther, as a college student, was walking home and he got caught in um, a terrible lightning storm. Lightning was striking all around him. Some accounts even say he got struck himself by lightning whatever, he was terrified, thought he was going to die. And so he called out to St. Anne, who was the patron saint of his family. He said, St. Anne, save me. If you will save me from this lightning storm and I don't die, I promise that I will become a monk. Well, he survived. And so to stay true to his word, he dropped out of law school and enrolled in a monastery. His dad was furious um, because his dad had put all this money in his education. But there, Luther, um, while he was there in the monastery, really started to obsess about what was going to happen to him when he died. And he experienced an emotion that he later called anfektung, anfektung in German, which best translates as extreme anxiety, maybe even depression. And it came from thinking he was rejected by God. He desperately wanted to know he was right with God and that he wouldn't go to hell. So he started to do everything he could do to try to gain an assurance of salvation. For example, he would fast for days on end. He would sleep on the floor. He would spend hours in confession trying to remember all of his sins. Because in order to get forgiveness for a sin, the church taught, you had to confess it. And if you couldn't remember it, you didn't confess it, and then you wouldn't get forgiveness for it. So he would spend five and six hours in the confessional trying to remember his sins. He would beat himself with a whip as a way of trying to show God that he was sorry. The church taught that all these things are are, are necessary to help ensure that you're right with God. But Luther wondered, how could he ever know that he had done enough? How did he know he'd confessed enough? How did he know he'd repented enough? How did he know he was sorry enough? He said trying to remember every sin in the confession was like trying to mop up the floor with the faucet running. Well, a mentor and confessor there at the monastery, whose name was Stalpitz, um, who had to sit and listen, by the way, to Luther's like six hours of confession on end, finally said to him, Martin, Martin, brother, you got to let this go. And Luther said, but how can I let it go? Isn't my soul the most important thing that I have? Shouldn't, I, shouldn't everybody be obsessed about this? And stop it, said, you know what I, you need, Luther? Here's what you need to do. You need to start teaching the Bible. And Luther said, I couldn't do that. If I tried to teach a Bible, it would kill me. Well, finally, Luther agreed to, to do that. He took up a volunteer Bible teaching post at the local university. And in his study, he started to see things in the Bible that at first confused him, but then delighted him. For example, the first book he taught from was the book of Psalms. He just taught all the way through it. And he came to Psalm 22, where David cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which was a prophecy about what Jesus would one day pray from the cross. And Luther said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's anfectum. That is the sense that you're rejected by God. That's what I feel. And then Luther said, I started to wonder, why does Jesus, the Son of God, why would he ever feel that way? And then he said, it finally started to dawn on me that Jesus had suffered my condemnation and judgment in my place. All that I felt because of my sin, Jesus felt in my place. By the way, it is from Martin Luther that we get that four-word summary we use for the gospel around here, Jesus in my place. It comes right from him. Then Martin Luther started to teach the book of Romans. That was next. But he said, I couldn't get out of chapter one. I tried to teach the Romans, but I couldn't get out of chapter one because there was a phrase in chapter one I couldn't get past. And it was the the phrase, the righteousness of God. In fact, I love his account of this so much. I have it um, up on a thing in my office. Here's what he says. I hated that phrase, righteousness of God, which I'd been taught to understand is the righteousness with which God punishes the unrighteous sinner. In other words, it's a standard you gotta live up to. And if you don't live up to it, then God's gonna punish you for not living up to it. Thus, I raged against God with a fierce and troubled conscience. 
Nevertheless, I beat relentlessly on Paul with that verse. I love that image for Bible study. I just beat on Paul, most earnestly desiring to know what Paul wanted. At last, by the mercy of God, meditating day and night, I gave heed to the context of the words, namely, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed as it is written, he through faith becomes righteous, shall live. There I begin to understand, look at this, that the righteousness of God is righteousness with which the merciful God justifies us by faith. It is, he called it, gift righteousness. Righteousness, not that God tells us to live up to, but righteousness that God gives us because of what Christ accomplished for us. Therefore, it's not about me confessing my sin enough. It's not about me feeling sorry enough or being good enough or beating myself enough. Jesus had done enough and it was finished in him. He had lived the life that I was supposed to live. He did everything in my place. Luther said it started at his baptism. Because Jesus, Luther pointed out, he said, he said, Jesus, when he was baptized by John the Baptist, it was a really odd scene because John calls it a baptism of repentance. And Luther said, my question was, if, what was Jesus repenting of? He'd never sinned. Why would Jesus be baptized in repentance if he'd never sinned? Jesus' answer in Matthew chapter three, he did it to fulfill all righteousness. Luther said, wasn't Jesus already fully righteous? Why would he fulfill all righteousness if he was fully righteous already? And Luther said, then it dawned on me that he was fulfilling my righteousness. He was repenting in my place. Jesus did everything in my place. He repented in my place. I could never feel sorry enough for my sin. So Jesus felt sorry for me. He lived the life I was supposed to live, died the death I was condemned to die, so that when I trust in him by faith, his record becomes mine. And there Luther developed this phrase, sola fide, in Latin, faith alone. Christ did it all. Simply putting faith in what Christ has done is what saves us. Here he said, here he said, I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. One of the most important questions in life is this, what exactly is the gospel? Is it a set of rules to follow? A lifestyle to uphold? This is something we have to get right. Scripture tells us that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. It's not about religion, it's about relationship. Religion keeps telling us that we need extra layers, but, but that's just not true. Religion says be and, and do it a certain way to be accepted, but, but that's not true either. The truth is that you are loved so deeply and accepted so fully in Christ that all you should be experiencing in Him is freedom. Freedom from yourself, freedom from your sin, and freedom from the pressure to do or to act a certain way to, to earn anything. This is the good news of the gospel, a relationship with God. And this, this truth is what we hope that you will embrace and enjoy for the rest of your life and your eternity. To help you grasp the love of Christ for you found in scripture, we'd like to send you a copy of What is the Gospel? A 20-day interactive devotional by J.D. Greer. This resource aims at taking a dedicated one-month period where Christian living is simplified, hopefully removing a whole bunch of the add-ons that have made it labored and complicated. We pray that you'll land on your feet, secure that God loves you and accepts you where you are when you come to Him in faith. The gospel is more than just the diving board into Christianity. It's actually the whole pool. So enjoy the freedom found in a right relationship with God. Request a copy of this devotional when you donate to support this ministry at the suggested level of $25 or more. Give us a call at 866-335-5220. That's 866-335-5220. Or go to jdgreer.com and request this resource today. It's time to settle this question once and for all. Well, meanwhile, back over in Rome, Pope Leo, the Pope at the time, wanted to finish a construction project he had begun on St. Peter's Basilica. You can still see it in Rome today. But Pope Leo had run out of money and he needed to raise some money, so he didn't do a multiply campaign. He started to sell indulgences. Now, indulgences were basically merit tokens that you could buy from the church that would earn you extra credit for heaven. You see, the saints, this is what the Pope taught, the saints, particularly the Virgin Mary, had lived such extraordinary lives that they had merit left over to spare. And so they could give you some of their merit and apply it to your account if you bought an indulgence from the Pope. 
So the Pope sent out all these preachers throughout the Holy Roman Empire to preach these fiery sermons about hell and the rapture and get everybody scared so that they would buy indulgences to shore up their chances of getting into heaven. In addition to that, the Pope taught you could also buy indulgences for the dead. You see, the church at the time believed in purgatory, which was a place in between heaven and hell where believers could go to pay off the remaining balance of their sins. You see, no believer, the church taught, no believer was good enough to go straight to heaven, except maybe for a few of the saints, the Virgin Mary. Now, most believers weren't so bad that they would go to hell. So instead, you would go to this holding area in between heaven and hell where you were punished for your sins for a few hundred years and they were purged out of you, which is where we get the word purgatory, purgatory. Well, um, you could help one of your relatives be released from purgatory early if you bought an indulgence for them. So for example, if you were worried about mama, maybe her drinking and cussing made you worried that she was stuck in purgatory somewhere, oh, you could help her out by buying her an indulgence. So these preachers would, would come to town, they'd be like, don't you care about mama? And they had all these little catchy poems that rhymed in German, also in English, but as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs, or the moment your money thumps in the chest, one of your relatives finds heavenly rest. Well, while Luther is studying Romans and hearing these sermons, it all starts to really take him off. And he said, for example, he said, if the Pope has all this credit to give out and he really loves us, why not just give it? Why would he make it for sale? Secondly, he said, and more importantly, isn't the righteousness of Jesus Christ sufficient? Do we also need the Virgin Mary's obedience added to Christ's obedience? And why would we have to go to purgatory to pay for our sin? Weren't Christ's sufferings for us complete? Didn't Jesus say it's finished? Doesn't scripture say he put away sin once for all by the sacrifice of himself? And so he listed out these and a bunch of other grievances in a document that we now refer to the 95 Theses, and he nailed them to the door of the church in Wittenberg. Incidentally, by the way, he wrote them in Latin because he intended for them only to be read by the religious elite, but they really struck a chord with the German people because all the German people resented the Pope putting this tax and this obligation on them. Uh, One scholar I read said that 80% of the Germans were persuaded by Luther's reasoning, 20% were not, and 10% just hated the Pope. And I realize that doesn't equal 100%, but um, studies show that seven out of six people are bad at math, and I'd be one of those people, okay? Um, but anyway, it, just, it, caught, it, it caught in Germany, and it took off. Well, the Catholic Emperor Charles V learned about all this, and so he wanted to put Luther to death as a heretic. The problem was that Luther had grown so popular among the Germans that King Charles couldn't do that without provoking a riot, at least without um, giving Luther a trial first. So he invited Luther to come recant his beliefs at something called the Deet of Worms. Now, one little quick thing here, just because I want you to be educated. This is the way it's written in English. And people always see that and like, oh, diet of worms, that's gross. And you're like, I'm on a carb-free diet. I bet you could really lose weight on the diet of worms. Okay, um, <laughs> one of our uh, uh, pastors, Will Taburin, was a college athlete at NC State. He said, when people really want to lose weight, I recommend the NC State diet, which is you only eat when NC State wins. He said, you'll lose hundreds of pounds that way. Um, <laughs> Just, hey, just kidding. Um, the Diet of Worms, it's not Diet of Worms in, in German, you pronounce the W as a V, so Diet of Worms. Um, it's a place that they were supposed to meet. Um, well, Luther gets the summons that he's got to meet King Charles and all these bishops at Worms. And he, his statement, he said, well, why do I need to go all the way to Worms to recant what I could just recant here in Wittenberg? If you really want me to recant, to take back what I said, then here you go. Previously, I said that the Pope was a representative of Jesus. Now I say he is an apostle of the devil. That's my recantation. That is actually what he said. He was spicy, I mean, let me tell you. So they bring Luther in to, to, to Worms and they spread out before him his 95 theses and all of his other books in front of him and they demand that he recant. Now Luther, uh, the story goes, witness to say, he uh, got really quiet and he asked for a day that he could think about it, which is kind of confusing because you're like, I thought he was... Um, you have to realize he thought he was going to die. He thought he would not recant and they would burn him at the stake the next day. So he just said, I need some time to think about this. And he goes back to his, his cell and he prays one of the most touching prayers that I've ever read in my life where basically he just says, God, I'm scared and I don't want to die, but I know this is right, but I'm not sure that I'm going to have the strength to do this. The next day, Luther walks back into the courtroom. It was even more packed than the day before. The king and all the princes and all the nobles were there. And Luther, they spread out the books before him and said, Luther, we demand that you recant these things. And Luther says, he says, well, first, 
There are many things in these books that the church agrees with, so I can't recant of those. Um, At which point, one of the bishops interrupted him and said, Luther, the question is, do you insist that the church is in error for selling indulgences? And are you continuing to hold to this ridiculous idea that the church and membership in the church and all these things are not necessary for salvation and that it's faith alone that's necessary for salvation? Are you really saying, Luther, that all these other church leaders are wrong and all these people throughout history have been wrong and that you, Luther, you alone are right? Witnesses said that Luther got really, really quiet for a minute. And then finally, he kind of looked up and looked the bishops in the eye. And he said, and I quote, since you want a simple reply, I will give you one without horns or teeth. Unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, for I do not accept the conclusions of councils or popes because they contradict each other, my conscience is held captive by the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand, I can do no other. God help me, amen. The courtroom at this point, witnesses say, just descended into chaos and Luther slipped out the back. Um, Seriously, King Charles had promised Luther safe conduct to Worms and back as part of the deal to get in there. So he had to let Luther walk out free. But as soon as Luther left, King Charles published what they called the Edict of Worms, in which he declared that once Luther got back to Wittenberg, anybody anywhere could kill him without punishment. So on the way home, some local militia kidnapped Luther and Luther thought he was gonna die. But these turned out to be friends and they took him and hid him in a castle in Wartburg where for several years he lived in secret, translated the Bible into common German, and just wrote a bunch of books that we still have today. You can visit the very cell where they kept him there at Wartburg. In fact, there's a famous story um, about this cell where Luther says, uh, they they believe he said he um, threw an inkwell at the devil. And uh, if you take a tour of it, if you have a savvy tour guide, they'll smudge some soot on the wall, and they'll say, here is the very spot where the inkwell exploded against the wall. But what Luther actually said in German, this is fascinating to me, what Luther literally said was, in this cell, I fought the devil with ink. And what he meant was not that he threw an inkwell at Satan, but that he fought Satan by writing out the first ever translation of the New Testament in the common German so that the people could read it because the word of God itself would do all the work. The problem was only the popes and only the priest had access to the word of God. And he said, everybody should have access to it. Not even Luther was expecting the impact this simple discovery would make. He later said, I didn't mean to cause the reformation and I'm not the one who engineered it and I'm not the one who propelled it forward. I simply translated the Bible and prayed and then sat back and drank a good pint of German beer while the word itself did all the work. Uh, Luther was a very colorful and deeply flawed individual, but that's what he said. The Reformation, which was built on the idea that salvation came through faith alone in Christ, began to spread like wildfire all throughout Europe as more and more preachers began to translate the Bible into the common language. What followed were some of the bloodiest years in history. Scholars say more Protestants died for their faith in the years following the Reformation than all the Christian martyrs in um, early Rome, yet they did it gladly. One historian of the time describes it. He said, no human being was able to take out of their hearts what they experienced. The fire of God itself burned within them. They would rather die 10 deaths than forsake the divine truth because they knew this was about eternity. Some things are worth fighting for. Paul knew it. Martin Luther knew it. The gospel is worth fighting for in our day because again, if we change it, we cut ourselves off from the presence of Christ and we obscure God's saving power. There is no other gospel. Jesus has done it all, and it is only by faith in him that you and I are saved and have the power of new life. Paul's going to spend the last half of chapter um, one in Galatians explaining why he is so zealous about the gospel. And basically what he says is the gospel is the only place that you can experience Jesus. He's going to use himself as case in point. He's going to say only a real resurrected Christ with real power could have changed me. And if you tamper with the message... You're gonna lose the presence of God and cut yourself off from his power. You know, I've heard it described like this before. If you, um, if you were dying of starvation and a rich person had compassion on you and said, I'm gonna give you access to my bank account. And so here's my, my ATM card. You can go anytime you want, take out any amount of money you want. All my millions and millions and millions of dollars are yours. And you say, well, what is the, what's the, the, the PIN number? And they said, the PIN number is 1973, the year that I was born. And you, uh, you say, oh, that's going to be hard for me to remember. I was born in 1978, so that's the pin number I prefer to remember. The rich person would say, well, you can try to enter 1978 if you want, but you're never going to have access to my money that way. If you want my money, you got to enter 1973. 
What Paul is saying is, if you want access to the riches of Jesus Christ, this is not a plan that you can edit. This is a plan that God gave and said, this is the way that you get it. It is by acknowledging that you have no power to save yourself and that you have no power to live the Christian life. That Jesus has done it all through his death and his resurrection and simply by believing that and resting the weight of your soul upon it, will you experience the forgiveness and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, I'm glad Luther believed this. I'm glad Paul believed this. I believe this, and I want you to believe it. And I want you to be willing to fight for it. Have you experienced this gospel? Are you fighting for this gospel? The end of the day, this is what it's about. Are you experiencing the power that flows from this gospel alone? Why don't you bow your heads, if you would, at all of our campuses? This is the true gospel. Have you ever experienced it? Let me make it very clear to you. You can't do anything to save yourself. Not be a good person, not pray, not read your Bible. You can give a bazillion dollars and it wouldn't make one bit of difference. Jesus did it all. Have you ever accepted what he did for you as grace, as your own? You could do it right now in this very moment. Father, make us people who are zealous for the gospel, willing to believe, willing to fight, willing to confess. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. To help you grasp the love of Christ for you found in Scripture, we'd like to send you a copy of What is the Gospel? A 20-day interactive devotional by J.D. Greer. This resource aims at taking a dedicated one-month period where Christian living is simplified, hopefully removing a whole bunch of the add-ons that have made it labored and complicated. We pray that you'll land on your feet, secure that God loves you and accepts you where you are when you come to Him in faith. The gospel is more than just the diving board into Christianity. It's actually the whole pool. So enjoy the freedom found in a right relationship with God. Request a copy of this devotional when you donate to support this ministry at the suggested level of $25 or more. Give us a call at 866-335-5220. That's 866-335-5220. Or go to jdgreer.com and request this resource today. It's time to settle this question once and for all. At the end of the day, y'all, I don't reject the messages of Muhammad and Joseph Smith. He's with Mormonism. I don't reject them because of deficiencies in their characters. I don't reject them because Muhammad was a violent warrior or because Joseph Smith was a polygamist. I reject them because what they teach stands in opposition to what came before it. And God wasn't wrong previously, right? And so, so, so that can't be. Listen. This is one of the reasons that you need to learn your Bible. Thanks for joining us today on Summit Life. As always, you can visit us at jdgreer.com. You'll find resources, transcripts, and all of our teaching available free of charge. We'll see you next time for Summit Life with J.D. Greer. Today's program was produced and sponsored by J.D. Greer Ministries.